Okay, you guys, the next section that we're going to be talking about uh, has to do what we call confidence intervals. So real quick, let's kind of do just a quick review of kind of some of the ideas that we have been covering, especially with like our normal distribution and the central limit theorem. So previously, you know, we have known that we have you know, some distribution where our normal distribution is centered at our mean. We have a standard deviation. And you know, if we were using the central limit theorem, we might also have a you know, n equals you know, like 50 or something. And then we'd do like sigma x bar. And we could ask questions like, what's the probability that we're going to be like in the 99th person, or uh, how big would our mean have to be if we were in the 99th percentile? Or we have a measurement that is so many standard deviations below the mean. What's the probability that we get that or less? And all of this is really based upon us knowing what the mu and our standard deviation actually are. And we write this a lot of times in our shorthand of n as, you know, this is our mean, our true mean, and this is our true variance. And so we've kind of written it like that. Okay, the problem with this is that what if we are doing you know, some new piece of science? Maybe we're a biologist and we've discovered a new type of tree and we don't know what the true mean is. Like a lot of times, especially when we're doing something new in psychology, biology, engineering, if we're doing something new, we don't know what that true mean is. And so the question is, well, are we stuck? And the answer is no. Uh, one thing that we can, one tool that we can actually use is what are called these confidence intervals. So let me, let me start off with talking about point estimators. We'll start there and then we'll move on to exactly how these confidence intervals work. Okay, so quick review. Uh, we know that we have these different things called, remember, our parameters and our statistics. So we'll put parameters here. Now we'll put statistics here. And we know that for our parameters, like we had mu, we had sigma, and we had pi. And for our statistics, this was x bar, the sigma was s, and our pi was p. Okay, and so we knew that, you know, if we wanted to this is our true mean, and this was the mean of the statistic, or of our sample that we took from our population. This is the true standard deviation, and s is instead the standard deviation of the sample that we took. And pi is the true proportion, whereas p is just the proportion of the sample that we took. Okay, so each of these values here, they also go by another name, and we can call these guys right here, these are point estimators. Now we know when we take a sample, we're not going to get the actual true mean, right? It's just, it's from, it's the mean from the sample. But the point estimators are our best guess of what is going on. So if we don't know what the true mean is, what we should do is that we should actually go and grab a sample and use that sample uh, to figure out our point estimate, and that is going to be our best guess of what is actually going on uh, in the population. So this is starting to get into what we call inferential statistics, where instead of looking at probabilities, right, we, we did that previously, but now we're actually we're going to take a sample and we're going to try to make some conclusion about the population. And we do that starting with kind of using these point estimators and building what are called confidence intervals. So we can build, for our class, we're going to be mostly focused on confidence intervals with respect to our mean and with respect to our proportions. Uh, we'll do other confidence intervals later. Uh, but th those are going to be our key ones that we're working on right now. And uh, you actually have seen confidence intervals. If you've ever listened to, you know, like the politics and they do some sort of poll, like what it's, uh, what's some presidential candidate's approval rating, and they say something like, you know, they have an approval rating of 62% plus or minus 3%. 
Well, what they have done right there is they have made what's called a confidence interval. All right, so let's start off. Let's kind of build a scenario real quick. So let's keep on with this idea that I am a botanist and I have been deep in the I don't know, rainforest somewhere and I discover a new tree. So it's a new tree that nobody has documented before. And I find a bunch of them. Let's say that I find something like uh, n equals 37. So I find 37 of these trees. And I know that the sample mean of them is something like 400 feet. And we'll start off with that. And I know that the sample standard deviation is equal to, we'll say, 20. And the population standard deviation, we'll put that into, I'll put it in a different color though, because this doesn't come from the sample. This comes from some previous knowledge. Maybe if it was like a, you know, in the same genus as a different tree, but we'll do sigma equals uh, 25. Okay, so let's take a peek at this real quick. Okay, so new tree. I don't know what the original distribution is, and I don't know what the true mean is. And we're going to assume at the beginning that we know what this standard deviation is. Um, a lot of times, though, too, we don't know what the population standard deviation is, and that's why I put up S as well. We'll get to using that in just a second. And just for kicks we're going to call my new tree super tallest. All right, so here's my new tree. This is kind of my scenario. So I don't know what the true mean height is. If I was some omnipotent being and I happened to know what the value was, I could say that mu uh, is actually equal to like, we'll say 400 and 15 feet. So I'm going to put these over here as like omnipotent being those. I guess we'll go with green. Okay, well, if I want to make some statement about what the true mean height of my super tallest is, I don't know that it's actually 415. I have no idea. I've only been able to track down 37 of these trees, and I found that their height was 400 feet. And so my best place to get started is to just start off with x bar. And so for this case, it's going to equal 400 but I know that 400 feet is probably wrong. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to be taller than this or if it's going to be smaller than this. But what I can do uh, is that I can say that it's within you know, some range of this. So I'm going to say that this is going to be plus or minus some value. And what we say that it's plus or minus is that it is going to be plus or minus what we call the margin of error. So what I need to do is I need to figure out, okay, well, what's this margin of error and how do I calculate it? The nice thing about our margin of error is that the margin of error uh, is actually things that we already know. We have to do just one modification and we can, uh, we can actually calculate this from using the equations that we already know. So on this first time, we're going to assume that I know what sigma is. Now you might say, like, well, how do you possibly know what the true uh, standard deviation is if you don't know what the true mean is. And maybe I could say that this tree is very similar to some other trees, and so I'm thinking that it's going to follow the same standard deviation. That happens sometimes. Uh, and so we're going to start off with assuming that I know what the standard deviation is. All right, so if we know that, that the confidence interval for means is this x bar plus or minus the margin of error, uh, we also do this. So you'll see it sometimes like this where we say that the mean is, this is another a Greek symbol, and it stands for contained within. 
contained within this equation. Okay, so now we've got to figure out how we calculate out the margin of error. We're going to start off with how we calculate it if we don't know, or if we do know what the standard deviation is. So what we could say is that margin of error, that this guy equals, we do this z, we have a new thing that we put in, alpha divided by 2, multiplied by sigma divided by the square root of n. So this guy right here is if we know what the population standard deviation is. And we should recognize a few of these pieces. We should recognize this sigma divided by the square root of n. We have called this guy a name before. And this is our standard error. So that's our standard error right there. And we know how to grab this, right? For sigma, I just put in this 25. For the square root of n, I just put in my 37. Now I just have to figure out how I get this z. OK, so what we got to do is we kind of got to backtrack and figure out, OK, what is this margin of error trying to do for us? And we have to, in, we have to include a new idea, and it's this idea of alpha. So let's kind of go back to our, um, our let, let me ju just draw a new distribution. Okay, so as long as our sample size is big enough, we don't need to know how super tall this is actually distributed. We can still use the central limit theorem to say, check, we know that the sampling distribution is going to be approximately normal, which is really handy for us. So instead of centering this guy at mu, I'm now going to center it at x bar. I'm going to center it about x bar, and what I'm going to say is, I'm going to try to capture where the true population mean is. Now, this doesn't guarantee that I'm actually going to capture it. But what we can say is, since we're doing this confidence interval, we can say that I'm like 95% confident that the true mean is captured inside of my confidence interval. Or I could say that I am 95 or 8% confident or 80% confident. But there are kind of trade-offs that we give when we either make a bigger confidence, if we have more confidence, or trade-offs when we have smaller confidence. So let me show you what we actually do when we say that we're like 95% confident. So let's kind of think back to when we were talking about our empirical rules. Remember how we said, you know, plus or minus one standard deviation, now 68%. And we're going to go plus or minus two standard deviations, and that was 95%. Okay, so that was kind of like capturing 90% of the area, 95% of the area under the curve was two standard deviations. Well, here, what I can say is that if I go plus or minus two standard deviations away from my mean, I can say that I'm 95% confident that the true population mean uh, is within, you know, it's plus or minus whatever our margin of error is from our mean. If I want it to be 97, oh, let me put that down real quick. That would be like 95% confident. If I want it to be 97% confident, right, this z value would actually have to be closer to 3. And we calculate this z value by figuring out what alpha is. So let me show you how we get alpha when we get our confidence level. So let's suppose over here that we have a confidence level that is equal to 0.95 or 95%. If that's what our confidence level is, alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Or over here, let me put my alpha down. As we'll say, I'll put it in pink, that alpha is equal to 1 minus our confidence level. So another way to think about alpha, and we'll kind of modify how we think about alpha uh, later, but for right now, we'll just talk about of it as the percent of time our confidence interval misses mean. 
right, let me kind of explain that particular definition real quick. So what we're talking about with this alpha is that if we are 95% confident that our true, our, our true population mean is contained within our particular confidence interval, what it also means is that we are 95 or 5% of the time when we do samples like this, so like if I were to take another 37 uh, trees and I built a new confidence interval, it's going to be a little bit different, right? Because the mean of those new 37 trees wouldn't necessarily be 400 feet. It might be 405 feet. But if I were to continue to do this over and over and over again, 95% of the time my confidence interval would in fact capture the true population mean. And 5% of the time it's going to miss that true population mean. So one of the things that we have to kind of concede is that we have to be willing to be wrong sometimes in statistics. And you're like, wait a second, let me just make my confidence interval 100%. Well, if I make my confidence interval 100%, we have problems. Because if we want to capture 100% of the data, we have to go to negative infinity, or from negative infinity to positive infinity. So then my margin of error is, is like, you know, I think that I'm 100% confident that the true population mean height of this tree is somewhere between negative infinity feet and positive infinity feet. And am I correct? I'm absolutely correct. The true population mean is going to be between those two values. But it's not useful. And the reason why it's not useful is because that range is way, way too big. And so sometimes we want to have, you know, a little bit smaller confidence, like maybe we only want 90% confidence because it tightens up our confidence interval a little bit. Sometimes we need to have our confidence be very, very big. And so in order to pull down our confidence interval, we need to have a bigger sample size. And those are like our two options to choose how big our confidence interval is. So if our, let me write this down. So if confidence level increases, then the confidence interval uh, increases as well in size. And then if the sample size n increases, then the confidence interval decreases in size. Those are about the only two things that we have any choice on. Now, in a lot of like your uh, homework assignments and things, the confidence level will be set for you. But in the real world, you get to set your confidence level at whatever level you want. A lot of times, industry or you know different uh, spe uh, specialties have different confidence levels that you work at. So, you know, psychology sometimes works at a lower confidence level, uh, like maybe 85%. And in physics and engineering, often the confidence level needs to be more like 99%. Um, OK, so if our confidence level increases, meaning we go to like 99%, our, the width of our confidence interval increases. Uh, but the, the reverse is true, too. If our confidence level decreases, like we go down to 80%, we could have a narrower confidence interval. And if the sample size increases, means our confidence interval is going to decrease in size. So th that's why we like a big sample size uh, when we do a lot of statistics is because it makes our, um, our confidence, or it, it makes our region, our confidence interval, nice and tight. We want our confidence interval nice and tight so that we're pretty certain about where this true mean actually is. OK, and then I just want to kind of shade in on this graph, like where alpha is, and why do we have to divide it by 2? Now, the reason why we divide this guy by 2 is because we are actually going to put the error in two spots on this graph. We're going to put it on both the upper and the lower tail. So this is alpha divided by 2. And this guy is going to be alpha divided by 2. We split it between the two sides. Uh, now, we don't have to do it this way. I will also show in a, in a little bit about how we can do a one-sided confidence interval. Maybe we want to throw all of the error to one side. That's fine. We can do that. Uh, but for right now, this is a basic confidence interval. This is showing us that our confidence interval is basically the point estimate of our x-bar plus or minus some margin of error. 
how we figure out the margin of error if we know what this population standard deviation is. We use this, um, we use this equation right here with z alpha divided by 2 multiplied by sigma divided by the square root of n, and that is a standard error. This alpha is found by 1 minus the confidence level. Our confidence level will be either given to us in the problem or we have to establish it ourselves. Uh, for this class, most of the time, it's going to be established for you in the problem. So then we can figure out what alpha is, and we can then do alpha divided by 2 right here. All right, so the last thing that I want to cover in this video is how do we get this z number? We use kind of an easy one with our empirical data, and we know that you know with 95%, it's going to be about 2. It's not actually 2. We can actually go look it up, but it's going to be really close to 2. Well, what we need to use in order to get this guy is we need to use our quantiles. So what we can do is we can use our software, and with our quantiles, we can leave the mean and the standard deviation as the standard normal, 1 and 0, or 0 for the mean and 1 for the standard deviation. And then we just have to put in alpha divided by 2. And that will give us our z value of how many standard deviations are we interested in with our specific confidence level for our confidence interval. So that's kind of like this in a nutshell. Uh, we are going to also talk about the next, uh, an example of this, of like how we actually put the numbers in. Uh, we can use these numbers in, in the next video. And then we're also going to show how our margin of error is modified when we don't know what the population standard deviation is.